Good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us tonight for a very special Hershey Area All Things Diversity Town Hall on Racial Discrimination. I'm Susan Cord, a member of Hershey Area All Things Diversity and a Dairy Township Supervisor. We welcome you uh, to our special conversation this evening. Certainly recent tragic events have united millions of people across the nation and throughout the world to come together for long lasting and sweeping change. The senseless killings of George Floyd and many other black Americans is a painful reminder that racism continues to plague our country. You may be struggling right now to figure out what you can do to make a difference. Coming together as a community is a positive step to be a part of the solution. Regardless of where you are in your personal journey to help end racism, we all hope that tonight's town hall provides the hope, the healing, the education, and the inspiration that you need. Tonight, after some opening remarks by Hershey Area All Things Diversity member, Lynette Chappelle Williams, we have uh, three speakers joining us including uh, the Reverend Dr. Franklin E. Hairston Allen, president of the Harrisburg chapter NAACP, Dairy Township Police Officer Garth Warner, and Erica Weiler-Timmons, PhD, Director of Psychological Services and Training at Milton Hershey School. Following each of the presentations, you're going to have a chance to ask questions using the chat feature in Zoom. Now we'll share as many questions as possible with the presenters given the time that we have this evening. And if your question doesn't get asked, we encourage you to reach out to us at Hershey Area All Things Diversity on Facebook and we'll do our best to get you a response. Now I'm going to turn things over to Amy Ziegler to share a little bit about our diversity group. Amy? Thank you very much. Um, I'm Amy Ziegler. I'm the Senior Director of the Hershey Story Museum, Hershey Gardens and Hershey Community Archives. And I have been a member of Hershey Area All Things Diversity since we formed in 2016. Um, our purpose is really to provide free events um, to educate, create awareness, and promote acceptance and inclusion in our community. We've built programs around LGBTQ topics, generational differences, female empowerment, and race. And um, we're doing that again tonight, and it won't be the last time that we do it. So we're very happy to have these panelists here today with us and as well as everyone else participating at home. And we hope that if this is the first time that you've joined um, Hershey Area All Things Diversity, that it won't be your last. So thank you very much for being with us. Um, I am going to throw things over to Lynette Chappelle Williams, who is going to talk about her work in diversity and inclusion. Thank you, Amy, and good evening, everyone. I'm Lynette Chappelle Williams. I'm the Chief Diversity Officer for Penn State Health and the Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion for the Penn State College of Medicine. And what I want to do is just take a couple of minutes to help their understanding what the frustration and the challenge has been in, in from a race relations perspective more recently. So we start with COVID-19. We know that the early data reflected that African Americans and Hispanic populations were disproportionately impacted by the coronavirus. Um, and depending on which state we were talking about, significantly um, disproportionate. And so that created a lot of stress, particularly because families were not able to come together for funerals. That's something that was really important to, to these communities. And in many cases, individuals were feeling very nervous or scared about what they needed to be doing to avoid um, being infected by the virus. So that's sort of what's going on. Then the next thing that comes up is a, a series of, um, of, of deaths that, that occurred, starting um, with Ahmaud Arbery, um, that was in uh, Georgia. He was the gentleman who um, was jogging um, when um, he was stopped by two individuals and, and was killed by two uh, individuals. Then we also had Breonna Taylor, who was killed by police officers in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, and it was as a result of a, a raid gone wrong. They had gotten to the wrong, the wrong house. And then, of course, more recently with George Floyd um, being killed by police officer um, in, in this, this past month. 
On top of that, um, we kind of have a history of African Americans being um, killed in a different variety of areas. And I, we kind of went through and looked at just the past eight years. And you see the number of names that pop up you know, over the past eight years of other individuals that have been lost as well. And then we add to that a concept that's been, that we've been hearing a lot more of called living wild black. And this is where individuals who are black or African American are doing just sort of routine things, maybe taking a walk or shopping or talking with someone. Um, we had um, recently here in Pennsylvania where um, five black women were playing golf and were accused of playing too slowly. And so the police were called. And the one that's most recent that people were really upset about was an, a woman in Central Park um, who interacted with a black male who was a bird watcher who shared, you know, your dog is supposed to be on a leash. And her response was, I'm going to call the police and tell them I'm being threatened by an African-American male, which she did do. Um, and so as people saw that unfold, it's like, this could happen to me. And so all of these things have really built up in terms of people feeling very frustrated. So that's the backdrop that we are working with as we kind of continue this conversation. Amy? Great, thank you, Lynette. Um, now it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Um, Reverend Dr. Franklin E. Hairston Allen serves as pastor of First Zion Baptist Church in Edgemont, Harrisburg for the past 13 years. He was installed as president of the Greater Harrisburg Area NAACP in January of 2017 and was reelected for the 2019-2020 year. Um, Dr. Allen has received his doctorate and seminary degrees. He is also a veteran and holds two honorable discharges. He served as director of Camp Central of the Central Baptist Association for five years and currently serves as facilitator of the layman. As president of the Greater Harrisburg Area NAACP, he has committed his focus to carrying out the mission of civil rights advocacy for the citizens of the Greater Harrisburg Area. Dr. Allen. Thank all of you so very much for the conversation this evening. God bless all of our participants as well as our listeners from near and far tonight. Um, my heart is heavy. As you know, I've been pastoring for, uh, now you know, that I've been pastoring for about 45 years and uh, the lateness of the hour and the days have become heavy on my heart and my mind because it seems to me that we are constantly repeating history. Things that are happening now are not nuanced. They are, they, they, since uh, my birth in 1952, one of the first incidents that happened three years later was um, uh, Emmett Till, the death of Emmett Till. He was a 14 year old young black male who happened to whistle uh, supposedly uh, at a white female in Mississippi, and this 14-year-old was hung. We also have, as we move to date a little closer, we have the case of Vanessa William, who was the first Black Miss America, and a photo shoot that she had done two years earlier uh, resulted in her giving up her Miss America crown, being the first woman of color uh, of the, in the United States. We move on to Mega Evans and so, so I don't want to give you a, uh, a uh, history in, in, in uh, civil rights this evening, but I wanted our audience to know that these things as they occur are reoccurrences. So the first thing I would say tonight to all of us is that we should never give up hope. Hope is essential to all of us in all communities, whether that community is white, black, or brown. We have to keep a contingency of hope uh, in our hearts with prayer. Why? Because there is unrest not only in our communities, in our state, and across the nation, and we will have to deal with those things. And if we're angry and upset and livid and, 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 and have uh, attitudes that are uncomfortable, then we won't, as uh, a people, be able to help our neighbors and our friends and our coworkers and those people that work alongside with us every day. So I'd say also, too, that we must all understand that uh, we inhabit uh, this planet called Earth, and we have to, we must, it's necessary for us to respect one another. 
uh, even in cases where uh, we deliberate a little bit, the best outcome will always be respect. And if you can't do that, then step away, take two steps back. Uh, I give no honor uh, to uh, vandalism and destroying of public property and personal property and things like that. There's no honor in that and it does not push forward our, our case of civil rights. And we need to be heard from the Congress of the United States through state governments and community governments because our communities are, uh, are not at rest. There is no peace. Even though uh, we are marching, uh, there is things to be done after the march. And so we have to play our role. We have to be good neighbors and, and good friends as we push the ball forward to become united and fought because we can't leave anyone behind, everyone, whether it's in education, whether it's in uh, human development uh, or economic stratus, everyone has to go forward. If not, we will continue and continue to repeat history over and over and over again. So to all of you that are on uh, tonight, let me say this, there must be peace and there must be clarity in all of us. I turn it back over to you. Thank you, Reverend Allen. Your, your words were very inspirational as we're uh, inviting our attendees now to submit questions for you. Uh, is there any advice that you can give to people watching on, on what they can do wherever they are in their journey um, dealing with this issue, whether they're a 20 year old and they're seeing this for the first time or they're a 60 year old and they've lived their life with this. Uh, what, what advice can you give to help navigate this storm, make sense out of it and, and really in, kind of empower everybody to make a difference in whatever way they can? I would first say to, to all of the participants tonight is that we have to tell the story. In order to tell the story, we have to communicate. So the beginning is, as we tell the story, we communicate with one another, we, we lower the level of anxiety. Talk to your friends, talk to your neighbors, talk to your churchgoers, talk to your faith community people, and begin the conversation, because the conversation then about what's going on, whether you and, and whatever perspective that you're, that you're using, um, it would be beautiful then to all of us begin the conversation. We have uh, so much information uh, tonight uh, that will be so helpful to all of those who are participating um, uh, in the process tonight and other speakers are going to come. But I would say in order to have clarity, in order to have peace, in order to have uh, something that we can gravitate to at the end of the day, there are three models that we need to use. One, what have I learned today? Two, what have I earned today? And three, what did I give today? And if we'll look in those three closets in our own personal human nature, we will find that peace and that clarity. What did I learn? What did I earn? And what did I give? I hope I've helped. Very much so. Amy, before we go to the next question, um, Brian, I want to make sure that uh, everybody is enabled in the conversation. Is everyone who's registered uh, able to access the, uh, the chat? I just want to make sure there are no technical issues here. It looks like there are some participants waiting to, um, to join, and I want to make sure I'm understanding that question correctly. We do have a limit of 100 connections, unfortunately. Um, it seems like we have 80, 81 attendees in already. So it seems like there's still room for more. Okay, well, good. So we hopefully have some room for some more. And if not, we encourage people um, hopefully to watch this on YouTube. Uh, and certainly um, uh, maybe we could monitor questions even through Messenger on Facebook if you're really unable to get into the, um, uh, the Zoom and have a question you'd like to ask. We'd be happy to monitor that as well. All right, let's get back to our questions. Amy, do you want to take the next one? I think you're muted. Amy, you're muted. Amy, you're muted. My apologies. The next question I think is more appropriate for Chief Warner. So I'm going to hold off on that one if we can come back to it. Um, but I did want to 
um, say this one. Uh, you gave us data on how COVID impacted the African American community in some states. What do we know about Pennsylvania? It feels like data that is critical support to support the African American community. Um, Lynette, do you have information regarding <laughs> Yeah. One of the things I want to share is um, what, one of the things we learned from the COVID-19 is that not all states collect um, demographic data. That's one of the things that Pennsylvania will that will be doing and that is in the process of, of doing now. Here's a, a question, um, Reverend Allen, for you. Um, uh, someone wrote, thank you for all the work we're doing to advance diversity and understanding the community. What more can we do to help the community understand that we need to support each other to make a huge difference in eradicating the biases? Mm -hmm. To shore up one's, uh, 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 I, I'm, I'm at a loss for words, but to shore up one's activity. If, if one wants to be active in what they're doing, join the NAACP, join other organizations in your community that are actually doing things and choose that organization that is very favorable to you and then become an action figure with that organization. And in doing that, uh, you connect. Because as human beings, we need talk. We're talkative and we need to, uh, to, to join uh, with others, and as I stated in, in, in my opening statements, either with a face-based or with other organizations that work with children, that work with offenders, that uh, work with other processes and things like that, do that. Join in, be a helping hand, participate, go to the meetings, you know, join in and understand the agenda and what's going on. I think that's very helpful for all of us in these trying times. Mm -hmm. What resources do you recommend to discuss racism with your children, um, youngest to teenage years? Is that a question directed to me? Yes. Okay. Or if you have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have at the NAACP, we have uh, our young people. We have the talent, the writers, the players, uh, the dancers and all. That's one part of the unit that we have, AXO program. And then our other AXO program, we have uh, what is called SWAG, where they're uh, our young uh, 12, 13, 14, and 15 year olds, where we invite uh, teachers and other people in their expertise to come in and talk to our children in our group meetings. We have a chapter in the Harrisburg uh, University and I'm there once a month and with the children once a month talking about these things that they've seen on TV, talking about actions in the community and other things like that, where they can, where they can gain a clarity and understand the history thereof. So again, we need to join in the process, not just talk about the process, not be an onlooker, but to join in and be active in that, be a doer. Mm -hmm. Great. To, to follow up to that, we have another question. Um, specifically, someone's asking, what can whites do to advocate for blacks? And I think you've touched on that a lot, but, but specifically, is there anything that you would recommend? That's always a great question. Um, I did two newsreels uh, this week. They were about two hours a piece. And uh, one of the production engineers asked me this question. I'll make it very short. He did not know that the NAACP was not a black organization. The NAACP is a white organization. It began with four white women in Niagara Falls, and Du Bois didn't come in until almost four to six years later. So I asked him, why aren't you participating in your organization? And he said, what organization? I said, your organization, the NAACP. You, did you not know that, you, that, uh, uh, that whites began and founded the NAACP? We have many members in the, in the Greater Harrisburg, and, but a lot of people don't know. They think it's a black community organization and really was founded by white in the beginning. That's 109 years ago. Mm -hmm. We have a question for someone who wondered if uh, there are plans to have a bus for Washington uh, for the march in the Harrisburg area? Not yet. We are confined because our, uh, our leadership and uh, Dr. Um, uh, our, our president, Derek Johnson, has said that we will be uh, inactive as far as meetings are concerned until July 15th. And so even our national conference has been postponed. That was to take place in uh, Massachusetts, in Boston, Massachusetts this year. Um, so we're kind of held down until we know 
have the green light to have meetings. And then there are a lot of uh, marches and other things that are, that are in the works. I hope that I've answered that question. Until July 15th, the NAACP nationally is being held down without meetings until, mm, yeah, until we face-to-face uh, -face meetings until we are cleared by national to do so. Mm. What sustainable impact can corporations in the area make? Well, if you're talking about 6th and Raleigh, which is the federal building where the GSA failed to meet with uh, black entrepreneurs for contracting in the new federal building, that's $223 million that we were excluded from, ostracized from, as far as workers are concerned. So what can we do? Corporate needs to engage in the process of inclusion. They have a responsibility, just like Harrisburg does, seek out, find, and, 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 and note uh, those entrepreneurs and, and Black-owned companies and corporations that can function in that building and other entities that we have in the city. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because of the devastation uh, and the disconnect in our communities because of, of, of corporate non-compliance. We, uh, we have some questions specific to education, um, which we're going to save a few of those for Kathy Sicker, who's a member of our committee and also the president of the local school board. But in your role, both with the NAACP and your role as a pastor, uh, what, what would you recommend for parents who are looking to educate their children, uh, either in terms of finding the right resources or having those conversations with them? Uh, so we make sure that we're educating our kids both at home and at school. There are so many, so many home-based organizations now that are calling out. I probably receive at least 25 or 30 calls a day on the NAACP line about organizations wanting to know the exact same thing. So again, I, I, I repeat this. There are so many home-based units in your community. Seek them out because they have professionals. You have so many professionals that are unknown in your own community, doctors, lawyers, scientists, people who, factory workers and others that, that, uh, that can help community organizations, faith-based organizations uh, move forward uh, during these uh, pandemic times. So the, inf the, the organizations are there, the information is there, you have to seek it out, you know. Reverend Allen, when we talked uh, last week, when we set up this session, we talked about um, this moment in history and what is it about this moment in history that has uh, unified so many people. And I'm wondering if you could, in, in conclusion, kind of talk a little bit about that and, and perhaps the, the very good that's coming from a very bad situation. The very good that's coming from what has happened and what we have seen, the lynching of George Floyd on national TV and as it has uh, moved to foreign soils and other things, human beings understand hurt. And let me make this very clear. Human beings understand hurt and they can't hide their pain and their hurt and their hurt. And so those who are in leadership, pastors, leaders, governors, mayors, and all of that, they're getting the picture There has been in the last nine days an awakening we're not fossil fuel. We're human beings. We're not stars in the sky. We're human beings. We get hungry, we ache, we pain, and we're going through some times, some turbulent times that we've never been, especially our young people. Those young people that, that were 14, 15 on the Capitol steps, and, and I couldn't scream as long as they could, but, you know, um, they, 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 had, they, were, they were trying to understand what was it that they saw on national TV. Is this real? Is this fiction? Does this really happen? There was an awakening. And so now America has to deal with the awakening. Mm -hmm. and, and just as a, a quick follow up to that, we also talked about kind of searching within to find mm -hmm. whatever it is that you can do in your space, wherever you are in your journey on this yes. topic to make some change. No one, no one can solve this overnight. So what advice would you give to people watching so that they can realize that any part that they do is, is a part in the right direction, a move in the right direction. Right, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pastoral question too, which makes it an enlightenment question. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, I've been preaching it for 46 years. 
where the Bible scripture says, let a man, let a person examine themselves. So every individual needs peace and they need clarity. And it only can be done from the inside out. Those are things that are done from the inside out, not the inside in. And so I invite all of the listeners tonight to join in to the NAACP. We meet every fourth uh, Thursday night when we're meeting. And uh, every culture, every color, white, brown, black, and all uh, the rainbow colors in between, you are invited to the arena where information, truth to power, is passed on every Thursday night. And we cover these events in the light in which they have occurred. So everyone uh, is welcome. And I hope that this town hall meeting is as successful as it can be because it is very enlightening. Mm -hmm. We thank you for the invitation and uh, also the inspirational words and for taking time out to talk with everyone this evening. We promised we'd let you go by seven so you could get ready for Bible study. I have, a, I I have a waiting congregation. There you go. So we will let you, we will excuse you from the rest of the session so that you can attend to everyone else. And we do appreciate the time you took with all of us this evening. So thank you. And thank you. Amy mentioned earlier that uh, Hershey Area All Things Diversity was born in 2016. And I also wanted to make sure that people watching were aware of uh, Dairy Township's involvement in uh, our efforts to help build a more inclusive and diverse community. Um, as part of its commitment to advance equity and inclusion for all residents and visitors, uh, the Dairy Township Board of Supervisors passed a resolution in 2017 that supports fairness and anti-discrimination and values and celebrates the differences in our community. You can read more about Resolution 1510, our commitment to equity and inclusion on the township website. And we knew when we passed that, that, that resolution that we had to go much beyond a resolution and really put that into action. And we certainly do that uh, by helping out with the Hershey Area All Things Diversity Committee with many other passionate members of our community. So uh, with that, I would like to turn to an esteemed member of the Dairy Township staff, and that is our police chief, Chief Garth Warner. Uh, let me share a little bit about our police chief with you, although I feel like he may not need an introduction. You all know him. Uh, chief Warner was raised and has lived and worked in Dairy Township nearly his entire life. After graduating from the Municipal Police Academy at Harrisburg Area Community College at age 19, he worked for the High Spire Borough Police Department and South London Dairy Township Police Department. Chief Warner joined the Dairy Township Police Department in March of 1988. He has served as the department's traffic safety section, in the traffic safety section, uh, as one of the department's certified traffic accident reconstructionists. His assignment for over 20 years was the pride and joy, I think, of his career, and that was the K-9 unit. Uh, Chief Warner was promoted to Lieutenant of Operations in 2012 and appointed as Chief of Police uh, in 2016. Uh, Chief is a member of the Dauphin County Chiefs of Police Association, past president and a current committee chair, Central Pennsylvania Chiefs of Police Association, Pennsylvania Chiefs of Police Association, and the International Chiefs of Police Association. He's also a member of the North American Police Work Dog Association and the FBI Law Enforcement Executive Development Association. Chief, thank you very much for taking time out to join us this evening. I know you shared your thoughts uh, both uh, with the newspaper and certainly on uh, the police department uh, page and your Facebook page and, and at the supervisors meeting last night. And, and on behalf of everybody in Dairy Township, we thank you and all the officers for your commitment to protecting everybody in our community, uh, visitors, residents alike. And, and I know everyone's going to be very interested to hear uh, some of your thoughts that you'd like to share. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Susan. Um, yeah, I, I really appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to talk tonight. Um, uh, definitely uh, with such a great panel, uh, listening to Dr. Allen um, and uh, his views on things, uh, I think is really important to get a lot of different types of people in, uh, different aspects, different backgrounds, uh, different uh, um, jobs, and, and get those folks together and talk, uh, but more importantly, listen. Um, we, can, we can talk all we want, uh, but unless we're willing to listen uh, to what's going on, um, I don't think things really get accomplished. So you really have to be 
willing to to open up and and kind of um, hear things from the other side, uh, hear things from different aspects, and relate how they how they uh, feel with you, and um, be able to talk and and get uh, what your feelings are out on that. So I really do appreciate the uh, the opportunity. Uh, uh, sometimes I feel like I'm I'm walking into a, um, a snake's pit and I'm 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 going to be attacked, but um, I, I don't think so in this in this case. Um, I think uh, uh, we have a lot of the same um, views on things. It's just coming from a different background. Um, I do want to talk on a couple things. Um, the the innocent the the incident in uh, Minneapolis. Um, when I saw that video, um, it made me sick. Uh, and this is coming from an officer that's been on for 35 years. Uh, we see death uh, more than uh, a lot of people do in different manners. Um, I've been with people as they took their last breath. Um, and that video um, was very disturbing. Uh, and it was hard. I, I haven't watched, I watched it one time. I haven't watched it again. I will not watch it again. Um, it was it was something very hard to watch. Any officer that can watch that video and try to defend some of the things that went on, uh, I, I don't I don't know what to say other than you should not, you should not be a police officer. Um, there was actions and inactions that were going on. Those officers had the care of George Floyd in their hands, and they failed that man. And in doing so, they tarnished the badge. They tarnished everybody that's working that tries to do a hard uh, and good job for law enforcement. Uh, and they, they failed their community, and they failed the nation. Uh, and now we're seeing what is happening because of that. Uh, so those are my thoughts on that. I, I tend to get a little bit emotional about that, uh, but uh, for good reason. Um, you know, people ask us about the uh, the protests and uh, what's going on now, um, and I have no issue with people being heard. Um, they need to be heard, and they need to have a voice. And the marches and the protests, the lawful, peaceful marches and protests um, in public spaces, uh, in front of cameras, uh, things like that, that needs to be done and those people need to be heard and they should be heard. Um, so I don't really have an issue with that. Um, the rioting and looting and killing that's been going on and there has been a lot of it um, going on since then. Um, it, it just makes me sad. Uh, it, uh, it's, it's something that I think We kind of want to understand, uh, but in a law enforcement aspect, we, it's, it's something that's totally against what we're all about. So it's very hard for, for a police officer to understand all that stuff. And um, I think, uh, and I think the, uh, Dr. Allen uh, referred to it is, it's gonna overshadow the message and it's gonna overshadow those voices that need to be heard. And um, we just can't, let all the bad stuff that's happening right now overshadow uh, what good can come of uh, these people talking and have their voices heard. Um, what we're doing here in Derry Township um, in reference to all the questions that have been raised, um, you know, we've, we've heard from a lot of people that uh, uh, there's a pledge uh, called Eight Can't Wait um, out there. And it has to deal with um, revising policies, um, banning chokeholds, uh, not shooting at moving vehicles, um, those type of things. Um, there's eight different things that uh, they want written into policies. Um, we have those in our policies already. Uh, we are a duly accredited uh, police department. Uh, we received our initial international accreditation through the um, uh, it's, it's called CALEA, it's the uh, Commission on uh, uh, Law Enforcement um, Accreditation. Um, commission 
I, I get uh, that in PLEAC a little bit mixed up, I'm sorry. That's the international accreditation. Um, that has 459 standards that our department uh, is required to meet. Uh, some of those standards uh, do not apply to us because we don't have horses, things like that. But uh, um, with, there's 459 standards that uh, departments have to meet. We are in the, the tier two level, which is the higher level. And we are considered a gold standard uh, department, and we have a meritorious um, designation for our gold standard. So we've been complying with those standards since 1997. Since 2001, when PLEAC, or Pennsylvania's Law Enforcement Accreditation, uh, became in existence, uh, we've been in, in compliance with those as well and are accredited through them. Uh, they have, um, I think, 181 standards, somewhere around there. I mean, it's 100, over 150 standards uh, that uh, they require departments to comply with. Um, and it's not just a matter of receiving that accreditation and then just putting it on a shelf or putting something on the wall and saying you have it. Uh, they require you to prove what you're doing uh, through documentation. Uh, they come in and inspect all your uh, reports um, and documents and make sure that you're you're doing what you what you say you're doing and what you're supposed to be doing. So it has held us to a higher standard and it has held our officers to a higher standard and I think it's uh, it's we were probably we got into it just wanting to have common standards or common general orders for our officers to follow and not realizing that in the future uh, this would be something that would assist us in being a professional police department. Um, so some of the things that we do uh, because of that accreditation is uh, we have the use of force policy that addresses the, the eight can't wait um, um, pledge. Um, and it, we review that policy every year. Um, in light of George Floyd, we're actually going to do a supplemental review of that policy just to make sure is there anything new that we can put in there or is there anything supplemental that we can put in there given the recent events uh, just to make sure that we're still on track we will review that each year but uh, we want to make sure that we're we're doing all we can to make sure those are up to date um, it also requires training so we have mandatory trainings every year use of force um, uh, legal updates um, all of our all of our um, uh, force weapons that we use, the taser, uh, pepper spray, baton, uh, firearm, uh, that is annual training, um, lethal force on how to use that, uh, when to use it, uh, all of our defensive tactics, how to handcuff people, how to do all those things. Um, we do that every year. Uh, and we also have training in bias-based policing. That's an annual training that we do just to make sure officers know what our policy is in reference to discrimination, um, uh, being a uh, bias in our actions, um, and how to prevent that. So all the officers get training every year. We go over the policy. Uh, we have uh, we might have a video. We might have somebody come in and talk about it. Uh, but that is an annual training that we do. Um, every other year, uh, we have um, somebody come in and deal with mental health. So how to deal with somebody that uh, is having a, a mental health crisis. Uh, this past, I think it was last year, we had somebody come in. I know there was a question, I kind of peeked at the questions a little bit. Uh, there was a question on how to deal with people with autism. So we had somebody from the state uh, that uh, is uh, from an agency that uh, deals with autistic uh, people uh, to come in and give us some of the things that we might see in people that are autistic. Uh, so when we encounter those people out on the street and we kind of feel that something may be a little bit off, uh, we know some of those uh, things that we're seeing and we know some of the triggers that might upset them. So we try to stay away, stay away from some of those triggers and uh, gain the confidence, confidence of those people that we're dealing with. Uh, De-escalation is another big one uh, on how to talk to people. Um, it's not an easy thing to do. I, I, have, I can build a good rapport with somebody and I can talk to somebody, but the next person, they might be the greatest cop in the world, but they might not be able to talk to people that well. They have it in their head what they want to do, uh, and they know they have a mission while they're on a call, but 
being able to talk to people is is kind of a, an art. And uh, if you're not very good at it, sometimes the communications can get mixed up. So those de-escalation techniques, uh, how to deal with people, those are things that were required through standards and training our officers in. So, um, you know, again, I, I, I look back to accreditation and, and, and realize that that is a big part of it. And if we're talking about, you know, um, uh, training uh, and those type of things is, we need to get everybody on the same playing field when it comes to policies. Um, and right now, all departments are not on the same playing field uh, and they're not on the same page. So uh, we need to get all the departments on, on the same page when it comes to use of force, things like that, because there are departments out there that don't have those policies that will protect uh, the officers and protect the citizens. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's where we really need to go. Some of the funding, uh, you know, that uh, they really need to concentrate on. Um, and then one of the things that we've been looking at, uh, it just hasn't come to fruition yet, but I hope to expedite it, is body-worn cameras. Uh, you want to do things that bring transparency to your, to your department with the community. And having that extra information out there, uh, you know, with, with body-worn cameras, recording what's happening, so you can go back and, I mean, you might have a teaching lesson in there, or you might be able to um, sit down with a person if they have a complaint, uh, if something's going on and, and review that and say, okay, I can see a breakdown in communication here. Here's, here's what the, the body camera caught and how can we come to a resolution with this? Does it, you know, is this something for internal investigation? Is it something that we just need to talk to the person about and let them see what happened? Because in, while they're in the situation, they might not realize it. Uh, so those type of things to bring transparency uh, to, to our agency, uh, working through social media, uh, things like that, uh, you know, is, is something that uh, can bring, bring legitimacy to, to an agency, and that's what we try to do. Um, and then one last thing I just want to touch on is um, – uh, it has to go along with the bias-based policing. Um, I will not stand for discrimination. Um, we all have implicit biases based on our backgrounds, based on our upbringings, things like that, uh, that may be um, uh, in our past. Uh, but being able to learn and listen from the black community, from the, the people of color, from the LGBTQ community, and coming together and learning from each other will break down those walls and break down those biases and help us to, to serve those communities better. And outright discrimination, um, it has no place in law enforcement, it has no place in this department, and I will not allow it. So uh, I just want to let people know that. So. Um, I'll wrap it up there. I'm sure there are people that have questions for me and I'll try to do the best I can. If you're not talking about dogs, uh, and German shepherds, I might not have the greatest answers, but I'll try. Well, we haven't gotten any dog questions yet. Sorry, <laughs> but you do, you do have a lot of questions, so we'll get right okay. into them. Uh, the first question is there are nearly 18,000 police jurisdictions in the United States. Is it safe to conclude that some of these departments have highly trained and professional officers, making fatal encounters much less likely than in other departments, meaning police brutality is a national problem, but that the solution to police violence will mainly have to occur at the local level. What are your thoughts on that? Um, yes and no. Um, you know, I think, I think a lot of it has to do with what each department is doing. And I mean, you're talking Pennsylvania right here where we have the most police departments of any other state. Uh, every borough has their own police department, uh, things like that. So you go to any other state and it's, you have a, a city police department, a county police department and state police. So, uh, you know, we have the most police departments of any other state and, uh, you know, they're not all run the same. Uh, they have different uh, governments uh, and they have uh, different things that are running the police department. So yes and no, I think there could be, a national standard um, uh, set out. And I th really think that's through um, accreditation. Um, the standards are already there. They don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, uh, getting 
um, those departments to uh, comply with those standards uh, is probably one of the first good steps. Um, but you are right, there are some areas where uh, use of force is, uh, is more common uh, and more prolific uh, than other areas. Um, some of that may be uh, just the environment and some of it may be uh, the, uh, the departments that are serving those environments. So, um, but I, I, I do think it can be done at the federal level uh, and having national standards, uh, but then it's gonna be up to each department to implement those standards. Great. Uh, the next comment question says, I'm pleased to hear of your eight can't wait support. How will you train police officers in your command to be sensitive to the trauma of black and brown citizens in Derry Township? I have a 15 year old biracial son who I fear for and we live right here in town. We love our police and firefighters in Hershey. We have felt love from those officers too. My hope is that training of new officers will send a strong message to all in Hershey of respect to our growing number of black and brown young men living and moving here. Yeah. Um, great, uh, great comment, great question. Um, to me, uh, and I try to, I've always tried to lead by example, um, even when I wasn't in a position of um, uh, leadership. Um, I always tried to lead by example in that you treat everybody like a human being. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know, maybe it was my upbringing. Uh, you know, I always was taught that if you want that person to respect and treat you well, you have to do the same to them. And sometimes it's hard to do when we have a suspect in custody that um, just broke into somebody's house. And, you know, to us, you know, for lack of better terms, that's a big no-no. Uh, you broke the law. Uh, but you also have to realize that that person made a poor decision. And you deal with the law enforcement aspect of that, but you still treat the person with fairness. Uh, and that should include uh, people of color and uh, people of diverse backgrounds. Um, so hopefully by leadership, uh, in the department and training those new officers in that mentality uh, will continue what we're doing. Obviously, you know, what you said is uh, they are basically having a good experience uh, interacting with our department. Uh, we want to keep that momentum going and we want to, and that's why we have training in bias-based policing. And, um, you know, that these are the things when you pull somebody over and um, a lot of times we don't know who the driver is before we pull them over. But when you walk up there and you have a black male driver that you have pulled over, it should be going through the officer's head that, all right, this is a different circumstance. I need to let this person know what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, and that I will treat them with respect um, as fully as I can, as long as they do the same with me and have that mutual understanding. There are many times when I place somebody under arrest, not a, and could have been um, uh, a person of color, it could have been a Caucasian, but some of the first words that I would always speak to that person is, listen, I will treat you with fairness and respect. All I ask for is the same in return and we'll get through this and nobody gets hurt or anything like that. Uh, but we'll get through this and I will treat you fairly and I will treat you with respect. A lot of time that, that is all it took uh, to let that person know that you're going to treat them with fairness and respect. Um, so knowing that, knowing that you're, you're running into that situation where that person might be afraid of you, um, you have to know how to deal, those, deal with those situations in the right way or else tensions rise uh, the officer thinks something's happening. The, the driver thinks something's happening and things go awry from there and, and you got a bad situation. So, you know, knowing how to deal with those situations and knowing how to deal with somebody that's afraid of you um, is, uh, goes a long way in uh, coming out with a good result and keeping everybody safe. Chief, this next question deals with the diversity within the force, and it's sort of a, a compilation of a few people's questions. Um, this person asked, it's great to hear about the policies and techniques you already have in place, but as a person of color, real life perspective is also very important. So I wonder about the current diversity of the Derry Township police force, and they'd like you to comment on that. 
So uh, I'll just be blunt and come out with it. We do not have a lot of diversity. Uh, we have one uh, uh, black uh, officer, uh, Sergeant Cotton, uh, who I'm uh, very good friends with. Um, and uh, we have um, a handful of uh, female police officers. Uh, but other than that, we do not have any diversity. Have we tried to instill that diversity uh, into our hiring process? Yes. Um, one of the glaring problems with that is we don't have a lot of applicants of color. We don't have a lot of black applicants. We don't have a lot of um, uh, Asian applicants, uh, Latino. Uh, we, we don't have people applying to be police officers uh, of, the, of that diversity of people of color. So um, we try to maintain a standard as far as integrity. Uh, th that is very important. So uh, we have had people of color apply before. Uh, they may make it uh, into maybe the, like the second round, uh, second phase of hiring. And then we're looking at integrity issues. And, you know, unfortunately, there are some things that have happened and, um, you know, there are better candidates uh, that uh, are in the same process. Uh, or uh, we just got through the process and, um, you know, those questions that we have about that candidate um, are glaring enough that if I put that person on and two years down the road, we have an issue and now, now there's an issue of uh, maybe that person uh, had an integrity issue while they're working. Um, it's, it, it reflects back on the department, it reflects back on me, and it reflects back on the township that we hired that person. So we're looking for people of diverse backgrounds and of diverse uh, ethnicities uh, to apply for these positions so we can put those people on and we can have the input of those people within the police department because what they, what they feel and think and what they've been through in their life is very important to how we police. Uh, so uh, we are still trying to diversify our report department, uh, but it's difficult. It really is difficult. And you can talk to any department in central Pennsylvania area and they are having the same issues. Uh, not only that, but lower numbers. Uh, I think uh, compared to, they just came out with the, uh, the latest list of people that were going to take the test. They completed the PT test, but they're going to take the written test and we were already down 200 candidates from what we were the year before. So not many people want to be in law enforcement. Uh, and um, sometimes I, I look at things that are going on and I, and I kind of don't blame them. But then in my heart, I know this is a noble profession and I love doing it. That's why I'm still here. Great. Um, this next question kind of covers a couple of different people who have asked. If there was an officer who is unbecoming of the badge, like the one who killed Mr. Floyd, is there a protected whistleblowing process for fellow officers to report? Is whistleblowing or reporting another officer considered taboo? In a department our size, I, don't, I would think in a, in a larger department, maybe Philadelphia, New York City, Pittsburgh, where you have a multitude of officers and you, the, the administration may not know all of the, the intricacies and the day-to-day -day operations that are going on and so forth. Uh, you may need that. Um, in a department our size uh, with only 40 sworn officers, including the administration, um, there's not much that goes on that we don't know about. Uh, so if an incident happens, use of force is uh, applied, um, somebody is injured or anything like that, we usually know the next day um, and, uh, you know, can uh, direct one of the lieutenants or a sergeant to start an investigation on it. Uh, so I don't, I'm not real familiar with that as far as a whistleblowing thing. Uh, we will hold our uh, officers accountable and we have. Um, uh, we've, we've fired officers, uh, we've disciplined officers, um, and uh, you know, I, you see you see a lot on the social media. You see a, a meme that goes around. Um, you know, good officers uh, dislike 
bad officers just as much as everybody else. And, and that is true. Um, we don't want those bad apples tarnishing what we do. So uh, we deal with that pretty swiftly. Uh, sometimes it might take a little while, uh, depending on how many witnesses we have to talk to, things like that. But uh, we do, we have a discipline process. Again, going back to accreditation, we have to do that. And um, that's uh, part of our process that we do. Chief, um, we're gonna wrap up with another question or two and kind of combine a few of them. Um, some really regarding training and what kind of diversity training officers may go through and also what you do as a police department to sort of check in on the mental well-being of officers and, and what do you do to help write that if you see that there are any issues with any of the officers? Yeah, as far as the, uh, the training, I kind of went over that a little bit uh, annually we have training in reference to bias-based policing and how, how we deal uh, with um, different ethnicities and people of color. Uh, and it changes, uh, we, don't, we don't do the same thing every year. Uh, we might have a speaker come in, um, uh, that type of thing. We might go over different um, uh, material um, uh, when it has to do with integrity, things like that, um, uh, and bias-based policing. So those type of things that we train, we kind of change things up so it's not the same thing. Um, and we're, we're talking about current events, uh, things like that. So I'm sure what has happened this year will be in our bias-based, uh, our next course of uh, bias-based police training. So um, that is something that's ongoing. And when something like this happens, believe me, the conversations uh, go on uh, for a long time. And you know, hopefully as an administration, as first line supervisors, we are getting the word out to uh, the line officers and the new officers, uh, you know, that something like this is unacceptable. And, um, you know, this is, these are the things that they need to think about. And, you know, this is the training that we give, but how do you apply it? So, yeah, that's, that's an ongoing thing. Um, and then the mental health aspect of things, uh, we have an employee assistance program. Um, it's through Access. Uh, uh, they're affiliated with the Godendia House. Um, we have peer officers uh, within the department, and then we also have peer officers outside the department that are with other departments. So if an officer has um, issues uh, that they're dealing with um, and they need assistance, uh, they can reach out to that peer officer. The peer officer is basically a listening device and, and can kind of maybe guide them to a resource that's within that EAP system um, and then get that person uh, the help that they need um, if needed. We also empower our first line supervisors, uh, lieutenants and myself, that uh, as an administrator or as a first line supervisors, if you see behavior, if you see uh, deficiencies in performance that haven't been noticed before and something's just off about this person, uh, you can direct them to see a peer officer. You can have a peer officer go talk with them uh, to make sure that uh, everything is good with them mentally uh, and it's not going to uh, blossom into something else that uh, may be catastrophic. Uh, so we, we try to really look after um, those officers um, that are working uh, because it's a high stress job. Um, you see more than uh, the average person or even uh, people in other professions uh, would see. You probably see something within a year, you'll see something that people will not see in their lifetime. Um, so uh, a lot of death, a lot of destruction, a lot of violence. Uh, so we try to make sure that the officers are, are mentally repair, prepared and, we, and repaired um, and um, make sure that they're taken care of. So it's very important to me. I'm a peer officer. Um, not too many officers come and talk to me anymore uh, just because of uh, who I am. Uh, but uh, I am a peer officer, have been a peer officer, and it's something that's that's really uh, close to my heart as far as taking care of the officers because we do go through, go through a lot of stress. Chief, thank you so much. We, we do need to move on, but there's one question that yep. I just have to ask from, uh, okay. from a participant. Uh, it says, okay. Chief Warner, 
Thank you for being a leader in law enforcement and in our community. If you could be the national police czar and could make changes for all of the police forces nationwide, what one or two changes would you recommend that would make you think the biggest impact on reforming policies in America? I can think of three things. Uh, first of all, and I, I've said this through my, this, this talk, is uh, standardizing policies. Uh, everybody should be working under standard policies, at least the core ones, use of force, um, you know, their operations, uh, how they, um, how they deal with people, things like that. Um, you know, this should be, this should be standardized. Um, and, um, the, the second thing is to, um, have more community engagement. Um, so, uh, reach out, engage with your community, um, listen to them because you are not a police officer uh, to um, enforce laws, and that's it. Uh, that's not what you're here for. You're here to serve your community. Uh, enforcing laws is part of that because you, you have to keep the peace and you have to keep uh, everybody happy, and enforcing laws is part of that. But you're, you're here to serve your community. Um, so listening and having participation from your community is, is highly important. And if departments are not doing that, um, they will never truly be able to serve their community in the right way because every community is different. So, you know, what works in our community might not work in Harrisburg or Lebanon. Um, you have to really engage the community and listen to them. And then um, um, the third thing is training. Um, I am a big, big advocate in sending officers to as much training as they can get especially in those areas where um, they might be able to take care of a situation without using force. Um, uh, De-escalation, um, knowing how to talk to people, um, those type of things are, are very important. And um, unless we get those officers trained, um, what can we expect of them? Um, you, have to, you have to make those expectations high, but you also have to train them to be able to do that. Chief, thank you for taking the time to talk with everyone this evening. We thank you for your leadership, for your compassion. If there was a national police czar position, we wouldn't want to lose you in Derry Township. We're very thankful that you're the police chief, and we appreciate everything that you do for us. So thanks again. Thank you. If you don't mind, I'll stay on. Uh, Please for do. The, for the rest. Please do. Okay. Kathy? Okay. My name is Kathy Sicker, and I'm the president of the Derry Township School District Board of Directors and I'm also a committee member on the All Things Diversity Committee. I will be introducing our next speaker, but first I would like to talk to you about the school district's commitment to diversity, inclusion, and equity. I am proud that our public school system is one of a small number of school districts out of 500 in Pennsylvania that has a diversity, equity, and inclusion policy. We adopted it last January, 2019. We have had many trainings on topics of diversity and revisions to curriculum, but we are committed to doing more. Our goal for the next school year is to update our institutional practices and educate ourselves about inclusion, race, belonging, diversity, equity, and allyship. We will be doing this by examining sixth through 12th grade social studies and English curriculum and specifically looking to examine systematic racism in the United States and its impact, the celebration of achievements of peoples from marginalized groups, the recognition that throughout history, some groups have had more power than others, the availability of texts by diverse authors and diverse characters, and continued learning by our adult learners and faculty to improve our educational experiences for all students. I hope that answered some of the questions that I already saw in the question and answer box. And now I would like to introduce our next speaker. We have Erica Weiler Timmons, PhD, and she will be speaking about healing and mental health. Dr. Weiler Timmons is the Director of Psychological Services and Training at Milton Hershey School. With over 20 years of experience as a psychologist serving youth who come from low-income families. She earned her bachelor's degree in psychology from Loyola, Loyola College in Maryland and her master's and doctoral degrees in school psychology from Temple University. 
Dr. Weiler Timmons is a Pennsylvania licensed psychologist, Pennsylvania certified school psychologist, and board certified in school psychology. She is a member of the American Psychological Association and American Board of Professional Psychology. Welcome, Dr. Weiler Timmons. Good evening. Um, to start, I would like to begin to acknowledge, as prior speakers have, have talked about, that this has been an incredibly stressful and challenging time for many people. And Americans have been reporting significant and sustained increases in symptoms of anxiety and depression related to the pandemic. And this includes their fears and anxieties, worries about their own health, as well as the health of their loved ones, concerns about jobs, illness, feelings of isolation, and major changes in life as we've known it. And then coupled with that, the events surrounding the deaths of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd have resulted in significant pain and sadness for many people in our country. It is vital during these difficult times that we care for ourselves so that we can also care for others. It's very important that we stay connected with others and talk about how we're feeling. This includes seeking the support of friends, families, and loved ones. While we need to be aware of what's going on in our world, we also need to make sure that we take a break from the media and the news and take care of ourselves, which includes engaging in self-care, eating healthy food, exercising, trying to get enough sleep, trying to keep our routines, and engaging activities that we enjoy. Most of us experience stressors throughout our lives, and as many times we can manage these issues on our own or with the support of family and friends. However, there are times when these steps alone are not sufficient. So if participants who are listening to this are really feeling profound sadness, anger, helplessness, hopelessness, they're withdrawing from others, or having difficulties with eating or sleep, it might be helpful to get support. If any of the participants are questioning whether their life is worth living or they have thoughts about death, please feel free to reach out. Please reach out to seek help right away. And at the end of the presentation, we have resources listed to help you um, to get support. One of the significant challenges that we face as a society is to eliminate bias, prejudice, stereotyping, and discrimination. For we know that these actions negatively impact people in society. And this is not new. Research has told us for many years that biases, stereotypes, and discrimination place a tremendous toll on people and on society, and they must be addressed. At this time, our nation faces many challenges, but through these challenges, we have the opportunity to embrace and create change if we make it a priority to do so. We know that the impact of racism and discrimination are profound. profound. Psychological research has found that the brain activity associated with social rejection, exclusion, and discrimination actually follows the same brain pattern that is associated with physical plane. So we can only imagine then the impact which occurs when rejection, exclusion, and discrimination occur on an ongoing basis. In fact, these tend to not be singular events. Individuals who've been excluded from opportunities and face discrimination may respond with anger and outrage, while others may internalize these experiences which ultimately can erode their self-esteem. Decades of research have found that discrimination is associated with poor health and mental health outcomes for African-American, Latino, Asian-American, American Indian, Alaska Native, Muslim American, and LGBTQ populations. Additionally, these groups often suffer from poor mental health outcomes due to multiple factors including inaccessibility of high quality mental health care services, perhaps cultural stigma about mental health care, discrimination, distrust of the medical care, the health care system, or an overall lack of awareness on how to seek mental health support. While the consequences of mental illness in minority populations may be long lasting as a result, they're also less likely to receive mental health care but we do have hope and the capacity to change. So one of the things we find is money studies found that as early as age three, children begin to pick up terms of racial prejudice without really understanding their meaning or significance. 
They may begin to form attachments with their own group and develop negative attitudes about other groups, which are different from their own experiences. When these are not challenged, this may result in bias and stereotypes about people based on the group to which they belong or based on their individual characteristics, which is why education that Kathy just talked about is so, so important. The manner in which we challenge these biases and stereotypes may be helpful or harmful to ourselves and society. It is critical, however, really to know that we do have the capacity to change. We have the capacity to learn, to grow, to seek to better understand the experiences and perspectives of others. Learning about other people and cultures helps us to understand different perspectives about the world in which we live. We can use this learning, reading, talking to people, volunteering, becoming involved to dispel myths and stereotypes that we might have about other people. People can, and they do, modify prejudicial attitudes and biases when they work on it. And when we keep in mind that we can change our own personal qualities, including our prejudices, that can really give us the hope and courage that we can change and work towards change as individuals in a society. Acceptance of and support of diversity is critical to the health and well being of our communities, especially since the diversity of the US population is ever expanding. By the year 2050 or sooner, groups currently identified as minorities are projected to constitute more than half of the US population. So by that time, when we're talking about diversity, we're talking about the majority of the US population. And we know that there's substantial evidence of the benefits of diversity to individuals and institutions and to the strength of society. So what can we do to make a difference? We have hope we can make change. So first, we have to recognize and really admit that biases are learned at early age. And they oftentimes don't align with our own ideas or belief systems about the need for justice and equality in our society. So it's really important that we educate ourselves and that we question and think about our own values and belief systems and recognize stereotypes that we might have and make a commitment to the importance of equality, not just through our words, but through our actions. Spend time with people who are different from us, create friendships from those people who are different from us, volunteer to share, solve shared problems through community service with those who are different from us. Research has found that intergroup contact across many different settings resulted in reduced intergroup bias and prejudice. Our beliefs and attitudes towards others improve when we focus on more on connection and our shared humanity than on our differences. Have difficult conversations. There's certainly a lot of those happening right now. And challenge others as well when there's inconsistencies between their beliefs, words, and actions. It's so hard and so difficult, but so important that we have these discussions with each other. Prejudice has the opportunity to change when it is not supported and when it is challenged. Develop empathy for individuals who are the target of prejudice. Evidence suggests that developing empathy for a person different from ourselves can also reduce bias towards members of that group. Continue to work towards the betterment of yourself and society. Attend sessions like this, sign up for the whole series, volunteer. To the extent that stereotypes are learned, it is possible to change stereotypes by unlearning and reversing them. And last but not least, contribute to the improvement of society. Support laws and regulations that require fair and equal treatment of all group of peoples. And a perfect example of this is what was shared earlier is the commitment to equality and inclusion in Derry Township. Embrace diversity and the opportunity for change. The Nobel laureate of biologist E.O. Wilson articulates in his book, The Diversity of Life. Diversity is the foundation for the survival and evolution of our species. In an evolutionary sense, human survival and advancement may be the most fundamental, fundamental benefit of diversity. Our differences benefit all of us. Erica, would you please um, share these resources? I think you had mentioned earlier, I think it'd be valuable for people to have them uh, and have you maybe explain a little bit about them. Sure. 
So first on the first referral is a general uh, Pennsylvania PA support and referral line um, that can help you seek assistance in locating providers. If you have any thoughts, ideas about death, suicide, or plan thoughts about um, suicidal ideation, the Suicide Prevention Lifeline. There's also a crisis text line that you can contact directly to seek support and assistance. And for veterans, there's also a talk line. So there's many free 24-7 um, resources that you can reach out to, to seek support and assistance. Thank you. That was very, very helpful to share those. And um, hopefully people are taking these down. And, and because this is being recorded, this will uh, continue to be a resource for people. Uh, we do want to get to some questions for you, Erica. Um, and if you just give me a second, let me stop sharing here. Um, one of the questions that uh, we had from a participant that I'd like you to try to answer, and then um, we're going to see if Kathy Sicker would like to answer it as well on behalf of Dairy Township School District, is, is there a plan to address trauma and adverse child experiences in school uh, or in clubs that are within either the Milton Hershey School or the Dairy Township School District uh, Diversity Club community? And, and uh, Erica, we'll start with you. That is a great question. I'm so pleased that we've been um, working on that for many years. And um, I think our school has done a phenomenal job. So we've been doing comprehensive education about adverse childhood experiences for all of our staff. Uh, we have also had for over five years social emotional learning curriculum in place and part of that training also talks about adverse childhood experiences diversity of experiences and really working on our shared values and sacred values as a school to promote healthy development and social emotional learning um, and within our community so very pleased that we've been we're really working at those um, areas for for many years now and we really see the importance of that uh, this is a great question. As a school board member, this was the one of the first questions I asked. I've been on the board for four and a half years. I'm also a licensed social worker, so I am um, well trained in trauma-informed care and adverse childhood experiences. And I'm very proud that our school district is training teachers. Um, we have administrators, our psychologists, our guidance counselors, our trauma-informed care um, trained and it, I, what's interesting is now um, at a school board level, the school board, the school board members have now been trained this last year with school board member training. Um, so even though it was already within my background, my fellow school board, uh, we went to a training for the Pennsylvania School Board Association. And now they all know about the ACE um, testing. And what I do love about our partnership with the Dairy Challenge at Police Department, we, ha we do have one school resource officer, and um, that is a collaboration between the school district and Dairy Challenge at Police Department. She is trained in trauma-informed care and de-escalation techniques. Um, so that was a very important thing for me to understand that, you know, when we're dealing with our students and their behavior issues, um, sometimes that behavior comes from something. And it could come from trauma in their background or an adverse childhood experience. And the way we can help a child learn better is to treat that, those issues in, in the child's life. Um, so I'm very proud of our, our work at Dairy Township School District in that area as well. So thank you for the question. And maybe a, a question for both of you about uh, curriculum. I know, Kathy, you mentioned uh, Dairy Township's commitment, and I'm, I'm certain at Milton Hershey School there's a commitment to this as well, mm -hmm. to make sure that we're teaching uh, about diversity in America. Maybe the two of you could talk a little bit about some of the efforts that go on in both school communities, because it all begins you know, with our kids at a very young age, of course at home, but certainly in school too. Can start. I would say one of the things that is such a wonderful aspect about work at Milton Hershey School is our student population is incredibly diverse. And so one of the aspects as we look at kind of our shared values within our social emotional learning curriculum is really attending to issues of diversity. Um, so that's certainly a, a very big and important part of that, um, given the diversity of our population and as you know, we become good citizens. And I know for our school district, um, equity has been on the forefront of our minds, particularly in the last three years. And race is a huge component of 
equity and diversity and inclusion training. Uh, we have a fabulous director of curriculum at Derry Township and um, we have a curriculum council. Um, it's a subcommittee of the school board. So we review all the curriculum and textbooks. And I can say that as a council and with our director of curriculum, we have put you know diversity um, inclusion and equity at the forefront of just making sure you know when a textbook textbook comes forward that it's inclusive it has Im it proper images of all of everybody and it um, is an accurate accurate portrayal of the history of our country um, but that's that's to say we can still do better and do more um, so it's a continuous effort for for the school district uh, but it is definitely a priority and has been for a while now Well, we don't have any more questions, but I do have a comment that's a very good one. It says, I don't have children in the Dairy, Ta in Dairy Township School District and am well past my days of going to school. But while the student in me is so excited to hear about the changes being considered by the school district for classes like social studies, and I wish I could be a part of that. So that's great news. And thank you for sharing those changes with us, Kathy. It's really wonderful to hear all the work that um, Dairy Township has been doing in that, in that area. And thank you, Erica Weiler Timmons, for joining us tonight and for sharing your insights. We really appreciate uh, both the educational perspective as well as the mental health perspective. I think um, sometimes we all just need to know we're not alone in how we're feeling and, and there's great comfort uh, that can come from that. So thank you for taking the time to talk with us this evening. And Kathy, I believe you have some organizations to share with us locally that people can support. Right, so we have a slide here of, um, if you would like to do more, here is a list of organizations to support. Uh, you can support the NAACP, the Urban League of Metropolitan Harrisburg, and the websites are up there as well. The National Coalition of 100 Black Women Incorporated, the Harrisburg chapter, African American Chamber of Commerce of Central Pennsylvania, Equal Justice Initiative, the Thurgood, Thurgood Marshall College Fund, knowyourrightscamp.com and blacklivesmatter.com. And special thanks to Alicia Petros from uh, the Hershey Company for providing that list to us tonight. Of course, there are many, many more organizations, but we did want to at least provide a starting point for you as you're doing research, if you're thinking about actually investing some resources into making change. All right, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what's going on with Hershey Area All Things Diversity. Um, this is a wonderful group and I've noticed lots of people in the questions were asking how to be involved and you know what they can do. Um, I would say the biggest thing you can do is follow us on Facebook where um, we have a page where we share lots of resources. There was a question about resources for talking about race with children. Um, there have been a couple of posts on our Facebook page about that. So please follow and stay up to date on programs that we have coming up. It's a really great, great way um, to keep in touch. Also, we're always interested in your ideas for what you want to learn about next. Um, so we've got the next four sessions planned, but we're always looking for planning in the future. So if you have suggestions of topics that you would like to hear, if you know an expert that you think would make a really great presenter, we're always willing to um, take some advice on that. So you can contact us through our Facebook page or any one of us on the committee. Um, Lynette, Susan, me, I'm at the museum. You can find my contact information on um, at hersheystory.org. Um, I'm happy to share those with the rest of the committee. Um, we have representatives from the Downtown Hershey Association, Penn State Milton S. Hershey Medical Center, the Hershey Company, Hershey Entertainment and Resorts Company, Milton Hershey School, the museum, the school district. So it's a really, I think, well-rounded and a lot of groups that cover most of the community. <laughs> so um, hopefully you know someone who's involved. We would love to have you involved in our sessions. Um, because of COVID um, and we were trying to plan for our upcoming season, we decided that the next two sessions, which will be taking place on September 23rd and November 11th, are going to be virtual um, but basically the same format as we've run the town hall this evening. So um, stay tuned for that. I will be sending out some more information via email. Um, we also will have it on the 
Facebook page as well as the Dairy Township website, and it will be in um, eblast from the township as well. Our next one happens to be, and we planned this before um, we planned the town hall, but I think it's very timely and I'm glad we're doing it again, will be on race relations in our community. And then on November 11th, we'll, we'll be talking about ways that we can be more inclusive to members of the military and veterans in our community. So stay tuned for those. The January and March sessions um, will be religious inclusion and transgender inclusion. We are not certain if they are going to be virtual or if we're going to have them um, at the school, at the middle school as we have been having them previously. So stay tuned for that, more information on that. But um, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you to all of our speakers and Susan and Kathy and Lynette who serve on the committee with me. I think this was a really wonderful way for us all to get together and have some very good discussion. And um, I look forward to doing this again in September. I couldn't agree more, Amy. Uh, as our committee members know, this was not a planned session. In fact, it was just a couple of days ago when we said we need to do something. We need to give our community a forum to come together. I mean, there's so many ways that we can come together, uh, you know, in church, in, in the workplace, certainly in home, in our schools. But there's something really special about coming together as a community to discuss these topics because we all want our community to be an inclusive welcoming, affirming one. And it's through sessions like this that we can continue that process. So I wanna thank all of you for joining us tonight, certainly to our presenters, uh, to all of the people who uh, helped work on this uh, on our committee, and special thanks to someone who doesn't often get thanks, and that's Brian Blausch, Dairy Township IT Manager. Uh, when I reached out to him last week and said, I've got something I'd like you to help us with. He quickly said, of course I will help. And he's been wonderful at navigating this with us. Uh, we had a little bit of a problem tonight, but it's a good problem. We are actually overloaded on participants on both YouTube and also on Zoom. So that's a good problem though, because it means people are interested in this topic. And thankfully this is being recorded and we will share it out so that more people can watch this and learn from the experts on our town hall meeting tonight. Uh, most of all, in addition to thanking all the people that helped, I just want to thank all of you for attending. It's only as we can work together as a community that we can really begin to make change together. So thank you all. Have a wonderful evening, and we appreciate the time you spent with us tonight.